uh, articulated in the Eventbrite um, in order to enroll in this course. And uh, you should have had the Hadabot software stack successfully set up already. This is what will help us go through the, um, the coding, hands-on co hands coding exercises. Um, if you don't have anything set up or you don't have Python experience, um, you know, don't worry, just follow along, uh, at least verbally. And uh, after the workshop, um, email one of the facilitators or myself and, uh, you know, we'll uh, see what's the best way for you to get uh, some of that hands-on uh, coding action that we've been doing here. We assume that you have no ROS experience, no robotics experience, that's totally fine. Um, a little bit of coding, Python coding experience plus engineering is all we ask for. Any questions so far? Fantastic, next slide, please. So a bit of a history to start. Um, around 2000, the era of free and open source software started really gaining momentum. Um, specifically around web development uh, and uh, anything web related. But around 2006, 2007, a nonprofit called Willow Garage was formed with the intention of creating free and open source software for robot development. From this initiative, um, they developed ROS, which is an acronym for Robot Operating System. Besides Ross, Willow Garage also has uh, created and maintained a number of other robotics related software. Uh, some of the more famous ones are uh, like OpenCV, Point Cloud Library, the Gazebo Ignition, robotic simulation platforms. All of these are still very, very popular today and used widely in research as well as industry. Uh, in parallel to creating Ross, Willow Garage also created this, this really fantastic, it's, it's actually a pretty amazing when you see it in person. It's a wheeled two arm robot called the PR2. And uh, you, you'll still see the PR2, even though I don't think it's actively being sold today, you'll still see it in research institutions being used for research development, et cetera, et cetera. But the duo of Ross and PR2 drove each other's development and really helped leap forward robotics research and mature the robotics industry into what we actually see today. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not exactly sure on the date, but Willow Garage disbanded sometime, I think, in early 2010s. Um, well, today, Open Robotics, also a nonprofit organization, helps maintain the core raw software and its development and its roadmap. Um, the Open Robotics team uh, was formed out of a subset of the Willow Garage team. So there is a continuity of expertise as well as experience. Um, the late, this this um, ownership of ROS includes the latest developments you know, of ROS2, which is version 2.0 of the original ROS. We'll talk more a little bit more about the differences between ROS1 and ROS2 later. But ROS2 uh, started development around 2014. Um, it is nearly a total re-implementation of ROS1, trying to fill all the shortcomings and inefficiencies of the original ROS. Um, as uh, you know, as time went on, people used ROS1 and uh, wanted certain types of improvements. Nearly all of those have been rolled into the re-implementation that is what we see today as ROS2. Since 2014, a number of ROS2 releases have been made. The latest ROS2 release is called Foxy Fitzroy, and that's what we'll be using for our hands-on coding examples. Um, despite our focus on ROS2 for the later coding lessons, for the remainder of these, um, the next couple of slides, which we'll talk about overview and uh, touch a little bit about nomenclature, it actually has nothing to do with ROS2. It's all encompassing. It actually encompasses ROS1 as well. So uh, we'll just call it a ROS terminology. And when there's ROS2 specific stuff that comes up, I'll try to be, um, be specific and distinguish what's ROS2 versus ROS1. Any questions so far? Okay, next slide. I was going to say we now have two TAs here. So Sam and Simeon, please try to manage the chat and let us know if there's any questions we need to address. Sorry, Jack. No worries. Um, and last but not least, 
Um, Kat Scott, which is from Open Robotics, is here as well. So Kat, if I say anything that is inaccurate or needs more coloring, um, please just feel free to interject and uh, you know um, jump right in. Um, she is definitely closer to the iron than I am in terms of Open Robotics and Ross. No, I'm, I'm just, uh, I might toss a few links that if people want to go read afterwards in there, stuff like that. Cool. Good resources for people to have. Cool. I, I don't want to revise history by accident. I think we have, we have <laughs> oh, enough of okay. that going on already. <laughs> all, all I ask is that you say open robotics and not OSRF. That's, like, that's okay. the battle I'm waging right now. Okay, no problem. Uh, open robotics is easier for me to say anyway. <laughs> all right, uh, moving onward. Despite its name, ROS is actually not really an operating system. Uh, it doesn't implement memory management or task scheduling, what you would expect from a traditional operating system. ROS is actually more of, in my mind, a robotics development framework. It draws many similarities to web development frameworks, such as uh, Django or Ruby on Rails. Hopefully some of these frameworks are uh, familiar names to the, uh, the participants here today. Um, as all good frameworks do, it offers developers a couple of um, benefits or features, if you will. Uh, one is you, it enforces modularity within your code. Um, it also has some way that allows you to share your module with others, uh, either outside of your organization or within your organization. Uh, it basically encourages you not to reinvent the wheel. If there's a module that someone has done already that does what you want, it is easy to sort of plug and play that module into whatever you're doing. Uh, number three, it offers various tools to help you either debug or test or even develop your modules. And all of this is provided with, uh, without compromising scalability. So you can scale your application um, beyond just developing it from your desktop and deploy it um, out in the world. Unlike Django, uh, which can only be developed in Python, or Rails, which can only be developed in Ruby, ROS actually has both a C++ and a Python interface, and they're both supported as first-class citizens by Open Robotics. There are other third-party interfaces as well. I believe Rust is one of them, and uh, maybe some other uh, um, third-party libraries. But our third-party um, third libraries that support other programming languages, but C++ and Python are the sort of like the first-class citizens. Uh, for this particular workshop, as I mentioned before, we'll be focusing on um, coding ROS2 using Python, specifically Python, Python 3. Any questions? Cool, next slide. So as a framework that encourages modularity and sharing of modules, uh, hundreds of these ROS robotics modules for both ROS1 and ROS2 have been developed by the community, establishing ROS really as the de facto standard in robotics research, as well as development in industry. As a roboticist who knows ROS, um, as it, you know, this is a kind of like a little bit of a, uh, um, a carrot stick here. If you learn ROS, you'll be to you'll be able to immediately develop and contribute to various uh, projects related to robotics at various different types of um, organizations, as well as in research, as well as industry. Um, I think it's a we're at a point in history where robotics is really kicking off. ROS is really gaining momentum, and if there's a if there is now is really the best time to learn ROS to get into some of the more exciting projects into in robotics. Any questions? Cool. Next slide. Uh, so as I've been talking about ROS, I uh, repeatedly mentioned modularity and sharing of modules. In ROS, a module is more formally known as a package. And this is ROS speak. When you talk to people who know ROS, they say ROS packages. They don't particularly say ROS modules. A um, ROS package is kind of like a bucket that consists of a number of individual ROS execution units called nodes. One node can be, say, a, um, a, a, a execution, unit, execution unit that reads, that, that grabs images from a web camera. Another node can be an execution unit that grabs images from a USB camera. And finally, you can have a node 
that takes all these camera images and tries to extract facial features from the images. Each node runs separately from other nodes. And I think you can start to see the modularity and the, uh, the shareability aspects of this particular design. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, no, the nodes communicate to each other using a publisher-subscriber architecture. The publisher-subscriber architecture actually has nothing to do with robotics, uh, it, but it reinforces modularity. And it is mainly a computer science design pattern that is uh, even used in backend website systems. The ROS pub sub architecture, nodes communicate to each other using what ROS people say, uh, what ROS people call ROS messages. So um, like topics and, uh, and pack, uh, sorry, like packages and nodes, messages is another ROS nomenclature. These messages are sent from a publisher downstream to a subscriber. Nodes are agnostic to who is upstream publishing and who's downstream subscribing to my message. So if I'm a publisher, I don't really care who's subscribing to the data that I'm publishing. As an example, to go back to the previous slide, if I am the node that is grabbing images from the web, uh, from a web camera, I'm just publishing these images out. I don't really care who is ingesting them. Similarly, if I'm that node that was uh, taking subscribing to camera images and trying to extract facial features out of them, I don't care who's publishing those images to me. It could be a web camera, it could be a USB camera, um, it could be from a file system. So uh, again, you can start to formulate this, um, this uh, you can start to understand how all the modularity is, uh, is enforced in ROS. Um, the, the messages are distributed from publisher to subscriber using these channels called topics. And topics is also Ross nomenclature. Um, so uh, it is something that you will hear Ross people say all the time. Uh, topics are like phone numbers. The flow of messages across different topics will be separated. And this is how, uh, how, they, how different um, publishers communicate directly to other subscribers. Any questions? Next slide. Uh, to give an example of how this publisher subscriber design works and, encourage, and encur further encourages modularity and sharing, here's another example. At the top right, there's a node, say it's implemented by team A. It can be a hardware driver that reads LIDAR data, for instance, and it'll just publish out the LIDAR range data as a range data message. Um, everyone here knows what a LIDAR is, right? If not, type it in the chat and hopefully one of the facilitators can give a quick demo or a quick uh, link to what a LIDAR is. Um, the bottom, bottom right node implemented also by team A can um, subscribe to these LIDAR range images and create a 3D point cloud. Now, this team A published their package of LIDAR reading as well as their uh, 3D point cloud nodes um, and it's been picked up and uh, learned about by a totally different organization called a Team B. They can take Team A's package of nodes and just choose the LiDAR capability, the LiDAR publishing capabilities, and create their own separate node to subscribe to this range message and do something totally different, like create a 2D map out of the data. So hopefully this is uh, clear. Any, anybody have any questions? It's a lot of info. I'm fire hosing a lot of information to everybody. Great. All right, next slide, please. So as mentioned before, um, the shareable modules of ROS, they're called ROS packages. Uh, here, I try to highlight and bring out all the nomenclatures that we touched upon um, sort of uh, in, in one slide, um, this way as a, as a little bit of a summary. Uh, we have packages, as a way to bucket different nodes. Um, and uh, nodes are execution units that run independently from each other. ROS messages are bundles of data that communicate amongst the nodes. ROS topics are the channels of which the messages flow through. Um, nodes can have publishers to publish out messages and nodes can have subscribers 
to subscribe to certain messages. In addition to these particular uh, ROS terms and concepts that I'm, I, I just mentioned, they're highlighted in red. There are some other terms in, highlighted in green, which are other means for nodes to interact with each other. There are services, uh, service servers, service clients. Um, these are other types of ROS concepts. Unfortunately, we won't be touching upon them in this workshop, but just know that uh, if you dive into the world of ROS, you'll also hear about them. And uh, in a future workshop, uh, we'll get a chance to work on them a little bit more. Okay, next slide. Um, so as mentioned before, all the terms and concepts are general ROS terms. They're not specific to ROS1 or ROS2. But unfortunately, ROS1 is going to end support somewhere around 2025, I believe. And Kat, feel free to correct me if, uh, in the, uh, if I'm wrong here. Uh, and uh, I'm personally more motivated to see the ROS community to focus uh, learning ROS2. But what are the main differences? So ROS1 requires you to explicitly launch a publisher subscriber broker, a process that maintains the topology of how publishers and subscribers are all connected to each other. This ensures that the messages get routed properly. This broker is known in ROS1 as called the ROS1 master. Without the ROS1 master, which needs to run before any of the nodes really uh, come online, the ROS1 messages cannot be routed properly. ROS2 does not require to launch a master or any broker. When a ROS2 node um, launches, it automatically re registers its topics and its services for other nodes um, to learn about and to connect to. And uh, that's really like one of the most unique features of ROS2, this lack of needing to launch a specific ROS master before you kick off any nodes. There are other, um, there, there are many, many actually other uh, differences between ROS1 and ROS2. This is kind of like a, a curated and summarized list, at least in, for me, what I found most compelling as I look through ROS1 and ROS2. Um, the, the, the two other differences that I find that are most salient for myself as a, as a sort of a robotics educator, as well as a, uh, a coder in ROS is that ROS1 uses a build system called Catkin, ROS2 uses CallCon. And uh, um, you can get confused if you don't know that there's the, the, these are the two different types of build systems for ROS1 and ROS2 respectively. Also, um, launch files, which hopefully we'll have time to touch upon, are incredibly important in launching complex robotic systems. The launch system in ROS1 is this XML-based um, script, whereas ROS2, it's all Python-based. As I mentioned before, there's many other differences. And if you just Google differences between ROS1 and ROS2, you'll be able to get a laundry list of all of them. Uh, any questions so far? Great, next slide, please. So we'll be focusing on ROS2 for the remainder of this workshop. Uh, specifically, what we're gonna do is create and code up a ROS2 node. Then we're gonna create a subscriber ROS2 node will publish some messages for that ROS2 subscriber node to subscribe to and to process. And we'll also learn how to use some ROS2 tools to understand how the ROS system is working. And uh, any other questions? All right, next slide. Before we start, um, I'd like to get a roll call on who was able to um, get the Hadabot software stack up and running. If you could just do like a uh, got it, thumbs up in the chat or, or plus one, that'd be great. All right, so one, two. Oh, it's actually quite a bit. Fantastic. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So just about seven, I believe. Uh, so at various points in the coding steps, um, we will try to be in lockstep. I think seven is enough such that we don't need a breakout room. Um, and we'll just try to be in lockstep with making sure everyone got their, their, uh, their whatever they need coded up, coded up, whatever they need compiled, compiled. Um, and if it doesn't work out, we'll, uh, we'll try to do breakout rooms um, and uh, adapt accordingly as the workshop goes on. 
How many, how many people do we have? We have, I heard at some point 27, because it looks like. It was supposed to be 35, but it looks like maybe about 11 are here. Um, I'm not counting me, Simeon and Sam are the TAs. So there are 16 people here. So I think there's 11 participants. So there's only about four who didn't get it done, I think. Okay. Uh, if you guys just wanna also uh, let me know where you're at too. I, I think I can, you know, you can DM me and I can answer questions, so. Thanks, Kat, that'd be yep. great. Uh, and I, I think I got another, Jacob also got it set up. So we have eight total. Uh, I'll be counting whenever I ask for um, a roll call, I'll, I guess we could expect eight plus ones before we move on. Uh, I will also assume that everyone has uh, grabbed the latest Hadabot main repository. Uh, if you haven't already done so, I haven't made any really any changes in the last couple of days. So if you had everything set up in the last couple of days, you should be all set. But feel free to run the first uh, first three commands up to git merge to get that up. I'll also assume that you have um, the Dr. Compose up and running. Is that the, uh, is that the case? If that's not the case, uh, let us know in the deck and um, we'll pause for a sec to get it, get you guys up and running. Okay, I think everyone's all set. Next slide, please. Uh, so to start, let's click on this link um, above, which will launch launch your browser-based VS Code. I'll cut and paste the link into the chat to make it easier to click through. When everyone has done so, um, please let me know, and I will um, I will uh, move on. I'm trying to get it done myself too here. Jack, do you need to share something on your screen or not really? No, I'm just going to walk through the steps in case there's some sort of uh, typo or bug in this way. I know in real time that something's amiss. Okay. All right. So I see two. We're trying to get six total, right? Or six more for a total of eight. Do, 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 do. I love how the captions even catch your singing. I love this. <laughs> uh, no, you're kidding me. Does it say I'm seeing? Oh, no way. <laughs> That's fantastic. I wonder if you can count the number of times I say um and like. It's it's fine. It's it's good. It makes you more approachable. Normal people do that. You, it's a superhuman ability not to do that, as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I have four in the chat. Uh, are people having problems, or is it just waiting for the computer to wake up? Oh, okay. So Chadika has some issues. What about the other people? Now, I feel like if we get through this one hurdle, then we're goading for the rest of the workshop because the rest of it is just clicking on links effectively. Oh, thank you, Roya. That's a good point. Well, um, a little reason behind the map madness, uh, the reason why we're using this particular Hattabot, Hattabot stack layer is uh, um, Ross is uh, pretty library intensive. And um, on various OSs, it might be a little bit hairy to install. And by compartmentalizing everything into these Docker containers, it provides a uniform way for everybody to be looking at the same thing, interacting in the same way. Uh, and uh, in theory, it, the effort should be smoother than if um, just start, install ROS natively on your system.
Okay, well, for the sake of time, why don't we try to move forward? I'll uh, I'll move. Let's see to run elevated to connect. Huh. Oh, well, I'll move forward, and um, well, hopefully the other four people can catch up. If it becomes a little bit uh, burdensome, then um, you know, I'm more than happy to help offline after the workshop to get everyone up and running. So um, fear not after the workshop. If you wanted to reach out to continue to do these coding examples, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I, I'm, I'm extremely motivated to help you guys out. Okay. So next slide, please. All right. For the four who were able to get the VS code up and running with the link, let us set up some terminals now. Um, we're going to open a terminal in VS Code, in the VS Code browser app. To do so, click, right click the um, Hadabot underscore WS folder on the left panel of your, um, of your VS Code browser and type in the select open terminal. You should see the terminal open up at the bottom, plus one if you can, um, if you got that working. Cool. Thanks, Kat, for dealing with this uh, Docker mess. Mm, it's okay. All right, uh, we have three. And last but not least, let's see who I'm waiting for here. Deval. All right, okay. Okay. I think we can move on. Um, the next thing we want to do in the terminal is to set is to prep us to start being able to work on ROS two. Um, type, yeah, you know, type it into the uh, type what you see on the on the deck, which is source opt ROS foxy setup dot bash, and don't type the dollar sign though. Dollar sign just indicates that it's a terminal command. We'll explain what this command does for now, just to sort of follow the instructions, and uh, we'll pro we promise we'll explain in a bit. Uh, please plus one if you are done with that, with the source with the source command. Do you think it'll help if we created a breakout room for the people that are unable to set up the Docker Compose up? Let me see where we're at. I, I'm trying to diagnose the problem, and once I have a better understanding of where we're at, then we can we can go and see um, what needs to happen. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Kat. All right, I think we can move on. Um, Carlotta, next slide. So we're to start coding, let's open up the source code file. Uh, to do so, click the Hadabot WS source um, M, well, whatever it says on the bottom. <laughs> and then you should be able to see the file and you could just click on that file and it should open up. Plus one when you have that done.
Cool. All right. These might be the hardest steps. <laughs> We're getting getting it work. Getting that link open is probably the hardest step. Okay, I think I'm waiting for one more. Is that right? One, two, three. One, two, three. <clears throat> if you're if you're trying to catch up here, that's it's fine. I'm gonna put the link to the slides in there too. So if you missed a couple commands, um, you can kind of step through and make sure you can catch up. Thanks, Kat. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, is every is everyone who can open the Python file has it open, or is uh, is are people having problems opening opening up that m zero one node pi dot pi file? All right, I think we're good to go. Um, oh wait, hold on. What's going on here? Left click. Right. Okay. Samuel, you're, I assume you're just trying to let people know what to do. Um, Carlotta, next step, please. So in the source code, you're going to notice a block of code that says uh, add timer callback code below pass. Replace that line, those two lines of code with what is highlighted on the bottom. And um, I know this might be a little bit uh, time consuming, but um, if you can type fast, type it out. If you can't type fast, I'm going to cheat a little bit and just cut and paste it into the chat. In Python, uh, I'm sure you guys uh, probably all know the the uh, indentation is incredibly important. So if you do decide to cut and paste that piece of code that I wrote in the chat, make sure that the indentation is appropriate or is accurate with what is written in the deck of slides. Or else it won't run. You're going to have errors. Plus one, when you get that, that piece of code replaced with the, um, the add timer passcode. Hey Jack, it might while we're waiting here, it might help just to contextualize what's what's going on here. Um, sure. So we are at this moment where we are in the process of implementing a ROS node, and uh, we're writing, we're filling in some of the uh, guts of this this uh, this node, and we're going to try to run it afterwards, and then we're going to walk through the code, as well as what it means to create a ROS program, as well as a ROS node. Is that what you meant by contextualized, Kat? Yeah, and just what you're, what you're calling. What are you pasting in there? Oh, OK. Um, we'll talk about it in a bit. I think it's uh, for the lack of a, just try to get people focused on getting that piece of code in there. Try to. Okay, cool. Plus one. Sweet. Let me try to cut and paste it again with indentation. No, it doesn't indent it for me. <laughs> Zoom kills my first couple of spaces. All right, how the other, I think I'm waiting for two more. Does everyone, anyone have questions? The other two, okay, one more, one more. I think Duvall is uh, the last guy we're waiting for.
or maybe not Jacob. Okay, let's uh, let's move on. Next stack, next slide, please. So when when we're done, uh, let's go back to the terminal. Uh, you should have already done the source opt Ross Foxy setup that bash. We will this will let you know what that does in a bit. But the next step is to type in this call con build command. So from your Hadabot underscore WS directory, if you didn't change directories at all, just you should be there by default. Type in call con space build and enter. Plus one when you get that up and running. Wow, my Mac actually takes a little bit of time. One plus one. You shouldn't see any comp compile errors. It should output um, two packages finished. Before that, it should say uh, starting, well, the starting the build of the CPP package, starting the build of the Python PY package, and then it should say finished Python package, finished CPP package. Not in those words, but uh, you know, they, the, the summary of the words will hint as such. And the last line I'll say is um, two packages finished. It took me about 30 seconds to build on my Mac. Anybody getting errors or they're just sort of still chugging through? See. Oh, interesting. So, uh, so Sarab, can you cut and paste what directory you're in? Um, the terminal. Are you in Hadabot I'm main? In the... Are you yeah, in Hadabot main? So you shouldn't be there. Uh, if you clicked on the link, so this is the directory you should be in. Oh, okay. But if you clicked on this link it should automatically sort of isolate out the specific subdirectory we're working under. If you just went to HTTP localhost 9123, it will take you to the main folder, which is not the right place because then Kalkon gets confused as to what you oh, need to okay, build. Okay. God, God. Yeah, it's uh, fortunate that this VS Code web browser library or web, web browser application allows me to use that question mark folder uh, URL variable to jump directly into the correct subfolder. Otherwise, you have to do CD and find the specific subfolder, which is um, you know just an extra step of hairiness. Okay. So Sarab, I think if you clicked on the link, that longer link, uh, it should take you to the correct subfolder. And if you open the terminal again, did the source opt Ross Foxy setup, you should be all set up um, yep. with the call comp build. So sure, yeah, I'm good. Good, okay. Um, last, well, second to last is you wanna type in source install setup.bash. We will tell you what this is doing in a bit. But for now, just sort of, uh, Say as I say, and we'll explain later. I'll cut and paste that into the, uh, into the chat so people can cheat. Usually when I have people work on these assignments asynchronously on their own, I, if I have them type it in. Um, the act of typing 
does something with our neurons to help us understand and internalize a little bit better. But for the sake of time, if you cut and paste, all's forgiven, no worries. Yeah, so for the people who successfully compiled, um, once you got the source install set up that bash working, let me know. Awesome, awesome. Cool. All right. I think uh, four might be a trailing five, but uh, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, last but not least, type in this ROS2 run command. It is, uh, it's a little bit hard to read. The, there's an underscore there. And there's a couple of underscore and four words. I'll, type, I'll also dump it in the chat for you to cut and paste. Hey, you should see every second a hello from Hadabot ROS2 intro Python node output being dumped every second. If you see that, do a plus one. Let's see two plus one so far. For those who got it working, if you don't want to, if you don't want this uh, this node running in the background forever as we go through um, the next couple of slides, you could do just hit Control C. Make sure your your um, your cursor is focused on that terminal panel, and just hit Control C, and it'll break out the break out of the uh, the node. Okay, four plus ones, maybe another trailing plus one. Type in Control C uh, and break out of it, and we'll move on to some explanation. But I'll pause here for one second. Everyone got is uh is everyone getting a little more comfortable with the VS Code web app? And uh, um, is there still some confusion, some problems? If there is, let me know for the four or five that, are, or that have been following along. Okay, Carlotta, next slide, please. All right, so what did we just do? Before we worked on anything ROS2 related, uh, so we, we actually need to prep our system environment. Um, for for ROS coding, um, and specifically, we before we even right after we opened the Bash terminal, we typed in this source opt ROS foxy setup .bash command. So ROS, at least installed on the Docker environment that you are working on right now, ROS is installed in this opt directory um, in the Docker container. This setup bash, what it does is it sets up the environment variables so that the bash terminal can find a number of different things that are needed to do ROS2 stuff. This includes setting up the paths and environments to find the command line tool, specifically the ROS2 command that you've been typing. Um, and we'll talk more about this ROS2 command line interface or CLI tool in a bit. It also helps set up the the source setup that bash helps set up the, the environment to find the libraries um, needed to compile and run the ROS2 programs. What um, there's a terminology for setting up this ROS2, this, this base ROS2 environment, and that's called setting up the underlay. The underlay are basically the underlying environment variables for the core installed ROS2 libraries. In our case, it's the core libraries for the Foxy release of ROS2. Does that make sense so far? If you're, if you're only 50% confused, you're actually in great shape. Underlays are like, uh, overlays are really like, it's a, it's a little bit uh, hairy to wrap your head around initially. Okay, next slide, please. So as you have deduced, callcon is the uh, build, tool, build tool for ROS2. It's what we used to build the code that we wrote. And we'll talk about the code in a bit. Um, don't worry about that. Just hold that thought. Uh, so what does callcon know how, what, what to build? Well, you called this command from the Hadabot underscore WS directory. 
This directory in ROS speak, and it's another ROS nomenclature, a ROS term, is called a ROS workspace. Under the workspace directory, there is a source folder. All the packages, and this is the same packages that we were talking about before earlier in the overview slide. The packages are listed out underneath the source folder. In our particular workspace, we have two packages, one called m01pkg underscore py, and another one called m01pkg underscore cpp. Um, and when you call callcon build from the workspace directory, callcon knows to go into the source directory and compile all the packages listed underneath that source, underneath in that source folder. Inside each package folder, there includes some um, raw specific meta files as well as the source files that help tell it, tell ROS2 how to build this package. We won't go, we won't dive deep into those meta files. Um, it is a, a, another beast within its own right um, to understand how packages are set up and how to set up them correctly for C coding or Python coding. But uh, I sort of took the liberty and set all those up for you so that we can just write source code. Uh, in the end, when Qualcomm fil finishes building, when it successfully builds everything, it adds two directories underneath this workspace directory. One is called the build directory and another one is called the install. These are where all the post-built binaries and libraries and other system scripts are held and are outputted. Any questions so far? Um, as we go through the slides, you'll notice some highlighted words, uh, specifically in red. When you Jack, see red, yes. Oh, can I a ask a quick question here before we yeah, go for it. real quick? Uh, and this is more just because this is sort of a pilot workshop. Um, uh, I want to understand, can you put a plus one in the chat if you've encountered uh, like CD, LS, PWD in a terminal before? I'm just trying to get a sense of that because we might have to cover that a little bit in the next lesson. Okay. And a minus one if you haven't, don't don't feel bad. Like, you know, everyone's got to learn Linux at some point, or I hope. <laughs> yeah, great, great question, Kat. This is, uh, you know, to get some context of the, how, the audience background, mm -hmm. something I totally skipped. Oh, no minus ones. That's good. Okay, cool. All right, everyone's on the same page. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Kat, um, anything else, Kat? Nope, that's it. That's All it. right, thank, thanks for jumping in there. Um, so where was I? Right, so the highlighted in red um, moving forward are all ROS terminologies for people to uh, to kind of uh, understand what are ROS terms and what aren't ROS terms. Uh, hopefully I was pretty consistent um, in highlighting everything in red, but at least the ROS terms in red. Okay, all right, next slide please, Carlotta. So after we did the Qualcomm build, uh, if you remember, we sourced another setup.bash file. Well, if you recall the first sourcing of the setup.bash, the one at the top, that one sets up an underlay and it sets the environment up for all the environment variables needed for the core ROS packages that was installed into the system. Well, this second source setup.bash file sets up what ROS people uh, call the overlay. And that, those are the environment variables to set up the binaries as well as the libraries, if you built libraries, for the, the stuff you built in your Hadabot underscore workspace folder. Um, any questions so far? Does that sort of make sense? All right, so the original source sets up an underlay the second source sets up an overlay. Uh, next slide, please. Another way of visualizing overlays and underlays, um, in case we're hopefully we're bumped up to only 25% confused now, but let's try to clear out the remaining 25%. Another way of visualizing overlays and underlays is um, say your team was uh, iteratively trying to improve a Terminator robot. The first thing it needs to do is set up the underlay, which sets up all the core ROS2 Foxy um, libraries and environment variables. Next slide, please. 
Next, uh, let's say you did some development with the T800 robot. Well, you CD into that workspace folder. You call com build all the packages in your T800 workspace. And then you set up the overlay for your T800 improvements on top of the, the, the core ROS library. Finally, let's say later on, you made some T1000 improvements that built on top of the T800 design and code, and you didn't want to rewrite everything. So you try to use some of the T800 functionalities for your T1000. Well, then you would not only build your T800 code and set up the overlay for that, Afterwards, you would go into the T1000 workspace, you build that, and you'll set up the overlay for T1000 on top of the overlay for T800. Okay, and next slide, please, Carlotta. And then finally, let's say right now, today in 2021, you're working on the latest Terminator robot. Um, you would build your current Terminator workspace, call com, build it, and set up the overlay on top of all the previous overlays that you've been working on to reuse whatever components they have, to reuse whatever libraries they have. So um, hopefully this clears out and clears out the remaining 25% of what underlays and overlays mean in ROS. Any questions? If you have a question, um, don't hesitate, type it out in the chat. Overlays, underlays. All right, fantastic. Proof. <laughs> All right, next slide, please, Kalada. Is overlay package independent, like package for each package? Um, they are independent in the sense that when you compile them, they shouldn't interfere with any other packages, assuming you didn't name them the same. I think no. that's the case. Is that right, Kat? Oh, so can you repeat that? So is overlay a package dependent? Like for each package, you create an overlay kind of thing? Uh, for each package? You know, I'm not, I would guess that, Col I don't know the internals of Colcon. I would guess that it would, the overlay would all get bumped as being like even between, like, so if you have like 10 different packages all in a workspace, I think they all get compressed into one overlay. Like they're all smooshed into one thing, right? Cause it's hierarchical, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on that. Right. Cause if you, if you applied them, this is going to be a little complex, but if you pl applied them sequentially, right, then it, there's order stuff that's going to pop up, right? So if you just kind of smoosh them all together into one big overlay, I think that's the way they do it. But I don't know a lot about the system internals. At the end of the day, you just have to think about it is like, here's all the stuff I need that are sort of like I didn't build. And here's all the stuff that like, you know, or maybe the best way I think to say this is here's all the stuff that is just core, right? Like that is coming from the, you know, coming from open robotics or like, you know, the core developers, here's everything that's maybe coming from packages I downloaded, and then here's everything that I'm building. So once you kind of think mm -hmm. about that and think of it as like a sandwich where you're like building up, okay, I need to grab all the, th first let's grab all the things that, you know, mm -hmm. are the core things. And then let's grab all the things that are thing, you know, packages that I've gotten from somebody else. And then you're like, okay, at, once that's all done, let's put all my stuff on top of that. Got okay. okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Kat. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Hi. Before we move on, uh, there's a question in the chat about um, setup of bash in Rust one and Rust two. Oh, I see. Um, so, Devel, um, Devel, the other folders might have intermediate files that get copied over to the install. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the case for some of the files. The install is where you should be sourcing from. I'm not sure what I'm, you know, Kat, again, feel free to jump in here. I never really studied what the differences are. I always work from the install directory. I think that's right. So what's effectively going on is you have three directories, right? You have a directory. Oh, this is a your... Ross one question, actually. Oh, anyway. it's Ross one question. Uh, source. Might be the same. Yeah, I think it's the same. 
Yeah, Ross One. I forgot if Ross One, um, if Cat can builds into a devel directory or an install directory, but they might be the same setup dot bash at the end of the day. Yeah, just just for more clarity about what's what's going on here is that okay, so you have the place where all your source code lives where you're working it's just you know source code files and then there's going to be a devel area where like all of the intermediary files um live right so all of your not your source code but all your source code once it's compiled and like all your message formats and stuff like that it's sort of like a temporary area scratch area that you're working in or everything's getting built to and then finally there's an install directory it's like oh I'm finished. That's where everything that's finished goes. Hopefully cool. that clarifies it a little bit. This is, I mean, this is pretty deep stuff for like just getting started, but yeah. Any other questions? Thanks for asking, Roya. Okay, onward. Um, so last but not least, we ran this ROS2 run command. So after we set up the overlay for our Hadabot workspace, we run this ROS2 command or the command line interface CLI. And we'll, as I mentioned before, we'll talk more about the ROS2 CL, ROS CLI later. But this ROS2 CLI um, takes a run command. The second argument is always the, the main command for the ROS2 CLI. And this run command takes two parameters. The first parameter is the package from which you want to run your ROS2 program. And the ROS2 program is the last parameter. Should be pretty obvious, hopefully it's straightforward. Um, if you had, if you built another um, node called my node in a package called my package, then you would run ROS2 run my package space my node. Okay, any other questions about ROS2 run? Just uh, just a heads up, I, I'm compiling a list of nodes. I'm going to put a video series in here where I run through all of the, the uh, ROS commands, well, the CLI commands fairly like, you know, going through all, how, all the, how all of them work. It's for dashing. It's not for Foxy, but it's pretty close. Cool. Well, I like to see that. Yeah. All right. Next slide, please, Colada. Um, so I said we promised we'd look into the code, but uh, let's um, maybe do a little bit more of an overview um, before we dive into the code. Let's talk a little bit about what a ROS2 program actually encompasses. So regardless of what language you use to program a ROS2 program, your ROS2 program would generally consists of four parts. The initialization, the instantiation of your ROS2 node or instantiation or creation. Uh, putting this ROS2 node in some sort of an infinite loop. And this is um, what ROS refers to as the ROS2 spin or ROS spin loop. This is, it goes back even into ROS1. It's a ROS terminology that encompasses ROS1 and 2. And what the spin loop does is it allows the node to process certain activities during the spinning of this loop. One of the activities might be a timer-based activity. So something like uh, what we've done, which is publish out a message every second or so. Uh, it might be every couple of seconds, publish your sensor data. Um, and uh, in addition to being a timer-based activity, another activity could be an event-based activity, such as I'm subscribed to camera images and a camera image just came so, and I will now have to do something. So the spin loop basically constantly looks for timer-based activities to do and as well as event-based, event-driven activities to do. And it will continue to do so um, until you hit control C or there's some sort of end program event that happens, most likely a control C, which ends the program in which case in your ROS2 program, you will want to write some code to gracefully clean up and shut down your program. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, hi. It, oh, sorry. Yeah. There's another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I think Simba is asking if we have to run the nodes individually. So you, Kat, again, clarification here. I believe in ROS2, 
you have to run each ROS program can only use one ROS node. There are other concepts in ROS called nodelets, or I think they're, they're named a little bit differently in ROS2 that allow you to have multiple node-like functionalities in one process. But the best mm -hmm. practice is to have one, whenever you type ROS run, it, it kicks off one node wrapped around one ROS2 program within one ROS2 program. Kat, you want to add some more color to that or uh, clarification? I mean, that, that's fairly that's fairly clear. What you're really going for is um, don't think of don't you don't want to build one big monolithic node. What you what you're going for generally is lots of small nodes that are all working together and are small pieces of a thing. You're composing them together. So if you're ever in a state where you're like, oh, well, I need this node to have like multiple threads running inside of it i mean you can do that i believe but like you don't generally you should be saying i want to have like this thing over here that does just one thing you need to think of notes it's better to think of notes as very very small programs or even more like functions and then you'll compose them together so don't try to smash too much into one if you are familiar with like how linux command line programs and then Linux pipes work, think of it more like that, where you're just like, I want the smallest, simplest thing, and then I'm going to take its output and pipe it into another thing that does something more. Does, that, does it help? Cool. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Simba. Anything else before we move on? These are great questions, by the way. OK, so let's dive into the code right now uh, in the M01 node pi.py code, uh, you, we didn't write this code, but if you look at the bottom of that file, you'll notice, you'll see a def main. So this is actually, a, ROS program is a main program. Uh, it is not something that's a library that's loaded or um, there, there's a main executable for your ROS2 program. In the main, you'll see the four pieces that I just described, the, initial, the, the initialization, the node creation, putting in the node into a spin loop, and you'll see the spin command, and you'll see the shutdown command. Most of these commands are called from this RCLPY library, which you import at the top. The This RCLPY stands for uh, ROS Client Library Python. There is a analogous ROS CL CPP library for if you ever program in C++. Of course, you wouldn't import it. You would sharp include it in C++. But um, this is uh, this the, the ROS uh, the RCL's PY library implements all the ROS2 Python interfaces needed to program your ROS2 program. Okay, so we just mapped the life of a ROS2 program onto the main code in our Python in our Python code. Next slide, please. If you go up a bit um, in the .py code, in the .py, .py file, you'll notice the actual creation or the uh, definition of your Python, of your Python ROS2 node. Um, when you inherit this node object, uh, when my ROS node inherits this node object, it makes it a ROS2 node through inheritance. This node object is part of the RCL Pi library, so nothing magical there. In the constructor, you'll see in the first line the initialization to or the constructor call to the actual parent node object. You pass in the node name which in this case is called intro underscore ROS2 underscore node underscore pi. That's the name of your ROS2 node. And we'll, uh, we'll, I think we'll use some ROS2 CLI to actually see that name in a bit. Um, and the line of code that you wrote in underneath that superclass constructor is the timer-driven activity for this particular ROS node that is implemented. And if you recall, when we put the no node into a spin loop, there's certain there's two main categories of activities that the spin loop will look for. One is timer-based and one is event-based. What you've implemented is basically a timer-based activity where every second you'll call this timer callback routine, which will output out 
a, uh, a debug, a debug print effectively. Questions, anyone? So far, so good. Okay, next slide, Carlotta. Okay, we're going to now um, play around with the ROS2 CLI. Uh, to do so, okay, there's a question. Is using a class for node require for ROS2? Uh, if you, you will have to inherit, so Roya asked in the chat, is using a class for node require for ROS2? I assume you're asking if, um, Carlotta, if we go back to the previous slide, that'd be great. Uh, if you're asking if my ROS node needs to inherit the node class, the answer is, I believe, yes. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a ROS node. Okay, next slide, please. So to get prepped up to use the ROS2 CLI to play, a little, to play with some more commands, let's open up another terminal in your VS Code web browser app. Uh, if you click on, if you look on the bottom panel, your terminal panel, you'll see a little plus sign. If you click on the plus sign, you will open a new terminal, a new bash terminal. And bash terminal, bash is just a, a specific type of terminal that, uh, that runs on Linux. And you can select which terminal you want with the drop down menu. So if you hit the drop down menu, you can select one bash, which goes back to your um, the original bash terminal you're using, or you can select two bash, which is the new one you open. Let's stick on two bash for now. Actually, the, let's go back to one bash. Please plus one when you're done. Um, open up a new terminal with the plus sign and select one bash again to go back to the original bash terminal that you were working on. Okay. The plus ones are coming faster. So uh, that's a good sign. It means people are getting more used to the environment. We got three, I think waiting on five, four, waiting on five. Cool. All right, next slide, please, Carlotta. All right, so we should be back on uh, one bash. Let's run the ROS2 program that you created again. Uh, the command is, I'll type it in the chat, but you can also see in the slides. This is the same command which we wrote, which we invoked as the last step in the previous uh, coding exercise. Okay, you should, um, a little pro tip here, if you hit up arrow, that also pulls up the last command you wrote. So you should see the, the outputs again, one, one a second being dumped out into your terminal. Plus one, when you get that working, just keep it running, cool. All right, three. As mentioned before, don't be shy about cut, just cutting and pasting the command from the from the chat into your terminal window, at least for, for the sake of time during this workshop. Any problems is uh, with the other two? Are there errors, issues? Hopefully not. Okay. Well, for those who've completed um, running their their ROS two node again, select two bash with the drop down menu and type in the command uh, in the in the deck of slides in the slide deck um, the first one sets up the underlay now type that into the chat remember before you do anything ross related you're going to have to set up this underlay. Otherwise, if you hit ROS2, the system will say command not found because the environment's not set up. Okay, and once you get the underlay set up with the source command, let's see what nodes are running with 
this ne next command called ROS2 node list, which I, already, which I also typed into the chat. And you're welcome to cut and paste that into your two bash terminal. Maybe do a plus one when people have got that ROS2 node list command working. So when you type in that command, you should see two nodes listed. One of which is exactly the name intro ROS2 node pi that is um, that matches the super class initial initialization routine. So remember we when we initialized um, the my ROS2 node with the super command, with the super init command, we passed in a ROS node name. Notice that the names match. So far, so good, everyone. Okay, so let's get some more information about this node as well. If we type in this, the next command, which is ROS2 node info, we could learn a little bit more about this actual node. You should see a bunch of information dumped out. If you scroll up, you'll see subscribers, publishers, service servers, servers, service clients, action servers, action clients. Does everyone see that when they do ROS2 node info? Okay, two plus ones. All right, so we are not gonna go too deeply into what service servers and service clients and action servers and action clients are. I don't know if you remember in the overview slide, but these are other ways nodes can communicate with each other. But if you notice, under the first two uh, headers, subscribers and publishers, um, there's no subscribers to this node. Um, there's a couple. Sorry to interrupt. We're missing slides. <laughs> oh, we're missing slides. Yeah. Carlotta, I think uh, you're. Okay, cool. We're preventing Carlotta from being able to multitask, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Did they disappear? Yeah, they're back now. We're good. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Uh, so if you if, if you typed in the ROS2 node info command, um, you'll notice that this particular node has no subscribers. It has a couple of publishers. These publishers are pre-built into the ROS2 system uh, for output as well as for parameters. These are two concepts. They're also ROS2 concepts, but we're not going to go deeply into them, just know that they're, they, they sort of, um, every single ROS node will have them. Um, but uh, um, the thing to note is that there's no subscribers and we are not publishing anything uh, explicitly that we at least created from this node. Can I, can I interject a little bit? Real Definitely, quickly? go for it. Um, so one thing to note about um, all of these commands is, I know they're super intimidating, but they're also self-documenting. So if you know the like secret uh, incantation, they will tell you everything they do. So if you do ROS2 just dash dash help, it will list everything about ROS2, like that it is in there. So then if you do, I believe it's ROS2 run dash dash help, it will tell you everything about just that run command. So they're all self-documenting. So if you find that you get in a spot where you're like, I don't know what to run here, or I don't know, you know, it's just a bunch of random letters and numbers, and I don't understand what's going on. You can just do, you know, a couple of the commands dash dash help, or I don't even know if you need the dash dash help, and it will tell you what's going on. So it's just a good thing to, to know. Yeah, thanks, Kat. 
for the yep. clarification. For what it's worth, a uh, Ross two the, the CLI is so rich and it's it's huge, hugely complex that uh, I don't think I've known any Ross uh, developer who doesn't have to use dash dash help sometime during their kind of like uh, Ross two use. Okay, um, next slide. Oh, oh great. Uh, before we move on, so we have about 35 minutes left. I'd um, like to pause here to make sure no one needs to take a break or uh, maybe, I don't know, if, if everyone's okay, I'm happy to move on. If people want a two to three minute break to you know, grab a drink of water or whatever, uh, why don't you put that in the chat? What do you think, Carlotta? You think we're, we're good to go? I'm good to go, but I'm a beast. So if they want a break, um, I guess put it in the chat if you need a break. Otherwise, we got 30 minutes left. Cool. Is everyone what from a from a scale of one to five, whereas one is I'm totally confused. Five is, oh, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. I'm working on the coding stuff as well. And four being, I totally get it. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm a little bit behind with the hands-on stuff. Can you type in the chat like where you are in terms of one to five at this point? Cool. Okay. Sweet. Well, we got four out of, uh, I think, eight participants. The other four are, okay, four, good. Four is still good. Four is good. You know, it's, uh, Why don't we just give everyone two, three minutes that, you know, we can chat and hang out. Everyone else can get a couple minutes just to make sure that they're all caught up. We can take a, a little break. I'll stop sharing for a minute and we can just answer questions. Come back in three minutes. Sounds yeah, good. Three, four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll stick around. Definitely. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think two more for quorum. And then anybody who has, I guess, one through three can ask questions in the next three minutes in the chat. So I think we have, so we still have eight participants here, I think. And thank you, Coyote. Coyote showed up after, so we have three TAs here as well. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> so we have a, a flip reverse. <laughs> okay. Okay, in super init intro ROS2 node pi, where does intro ROS2 node pi come from? Is it built into ROS2? You, so uh, I'm answering the question that's in the chat. So basically he's asking in the, when you create a node, right? So super init, right? You're saying, uh, so there's inheritance going on. So you're saying I'm creating a new node and it takes one parameter. And that one parameter is, what do you want to call this thing? So basically you're saying, I want to call this thing intro ROS2 node pi. Um, so yeah, it's just a name. You could probably, I think you should be able to go and change it to, you know, my no, you know, my very special node and it should just be okay. And go in, go in and change it, say Roya, Roya Rockstar. And, you're, and then when you do ROS2 node list, you should see Roya Rockstar listed after you build it and run it again, obviously. Chad, is there a specific question you have about when you started um, getting a little muddy? You can type it in the chat if you don't want to come off of mute. No, he just got tripped up a little bit early on too. So it's been kind of okay. a step behind. That's why I'm giving everyone a minute to sort of make sure everything's good. Yeah, this is a fire hose. If you're like trying to catch up, it's even, it's like two fire hoses into the mouth. Okay. Well, if you know a little bit about Ross one, the nomenclature is nearly identical. It's the, the implementation is, is where it differs. What devices can we run? Kat, you could probably, this is probably a, a, your, you have a more visibility in answering the device question. 
No, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing cool except for like Mars rovers and stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it really, it really depends. Um, so there's Turtlebot, which is the sort of the official one. There's a Hattabot, which is Jack's robot. There are all sorts of sensors. There's every robot that you can, you know, you can roll on your own. Um, there's a bunch of different companies. We actually have a, a website called, I'll put this in the notes too. It's, I'm, I'm right in the middle of like trying to get this page redone because it looks a little janky, but there is this uh, robots.ross.org. Um, so there's a big list of stuff there. I don't think that's in any way comprehensive, but that gives you an idea of what's possible. Well, Simba, when you ask devices, are you asking about operating system types of um, chip architectures or are you asking about robots? Um, I guess both. Both. Uh, maybe, so like, I, I maybe like does it does it have to be Linux or would it be does it work on like microcontrollers or that kind of stuff? So two two bits here. So the first thing is, yes, you can run ROS on places not Linux. It, it I, I'll say this: there, you know, the level of support for things that aren't sort of the preferred OS for a ROS distro it's just going to cause you pain. And so you're probably better off, like, instead of like trying to run it natively on the OS, running it in like either a virtual machine or a Docker container. So that's what I'd recommend. Um, the, in terms of microcontrollers, ROS2, um, so historically, ROS was um, a top-down thing for, for um, robots. So you're not doing the low level, like real-time control. And then we decided in ROS2, like, well, people want to do real-time control and, and interface with ROS. So now there's this thing, and it's sort of nascent, but it's really on, like, the big upswing. It's called Micro ROS. And so it's basically uh, for embedded microcontrollers. So I've seen it on ESP32s and um, TNC boards and some of the higher-end Arduinos now. Um, and you can actually run it on the... You can run, um, it's not ROS exactly. It's basically a thing in the RTOS that can communicate with ROS natively. Okay. I'll, put the, I'll put that in those notes I'm making too. One, one thing I would like to see, which isn't very, very streamlined, is ROS2 running on a Raspberry Pi using the Raspberry OS or Raspbian OS. Um, there, there's my there's my plug to you, Cat. <laughs> I'll do it with all my spare time. <laughs> so for those who are interested in running ROS2 on a Raspberry Pi, you could do it. I think the community has gotten it working. I tried and uh, um, decided that um, it was it was a little more a little more painful than I signed up for. The, the newer the newer Raspberry Pis, it is a lot easier than like the first gen Raspberry Pis. I will say that the first ones aren't really supported that well. It's, it's a little weak. Yeah. Okay, should we uh, get started again? We'll be here. We'll be around to answer more questions, but for the sake of time and the people who need to kick off at four, uh, let's move forward. So hopefully everyone's back. Uh, we concluded um, the implementation and hands-on coding exercise for a ROS2 node. Congratulations, you wrote your first node. It's actually not hugely complicated to write a node. Um, the robotics behind the ROS is way harder than the ROS itself. So uh, moving on, let's, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into ROS2 topics. And we'll implement specifically, we'll be implementing a ROS2 subscriber node for topic messages. Um, click on this link in the in the uh, slide. I'm going to copy the link and paste it into the chat. This will, like with the previous M01 nodes. Um, lesson, this will jump you directly into the folder specific for this particular topics lesson. Plus one, when you get that working.
Okay. Good. One. One, Two. one. Three, All right. four. Okay, I think we're close. Next slide, Carlotta. Like with the previous exercise, let's open up a terminal again by right clicking uh, Hadabot workspace and opening a terminal. And once you have that terminal open up, let's set up the underlay with the usual suspect, source, opt, Fox Ross, Foxy setup. And I'll paste that into the paste that into the chat. Plus one when you have it all up and go up and running. Cool. All right. Next slide, Carlotta. Let's open the subscriber Python code that we're going to be augmenting. The series of folders to click through are listed above. Once you get the .py file open, give me a plus one. Cool. All right. Um, in that file, uh, as shown on the deck, there is a add subscriber code below pass line again. You want to replace it with the highlighted series of, uh, well, this highlighted one line creates a subscription call. And I'll cut and paste that into the chat. If you are going to cut and paste it from the chat into your VS code, just make sure you got the indentation correct. Because again, Python doesn't like bad indentation. Oh, one thing I forgot to note is you have to save the file, but I think people picked that one up already. <laughs> okay, plus one when you guys get that up and run or added into your .py file. Maybe next slide, Carlotta. Any more plus ones before we move on? Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, let's. All this is repeated uh, from the node exercise. But we want to build the node, this, this new subscriber node. Uh, and to do so, we hit, we type in Qualcomm build, which will take a little bit of time, depending on what kind of system you're using. And once it's done, All right, once it's done, you want to set up set up the overlay by sourcing the post-built setup script from your workspace. I'll type that in chat. And last but not least, once you have the overlay set up, 
We will run the node. What you should see is, I'll type it in the chat. A message that says we're waiting for a ROS2 message. When you see that, do a plus one. If you see an error, um, also feel free to type that in. We'll try to give you a hand. Cool. All right, for those who see the message, let's keep this up and running. So do not hit control C like we did with the node, with the, with the node exercise. Keep it running. Let, let it just hang out there waiting for a ROS2 message. Okay, three plus ones. The fourth. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. We're going to use the ROS2 CLI again to interact with the subscriber node that we just <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> uh, to do that, let's open another second terminal again. If uh, for those who don't remember, you want to hit that little plus sign at the bottom of the terminal panel, and you're going to see a two bash come up. Next slide, please, Carlotta. Once you got the two bash set up, we're, we're going to stay on the two bash. We're not going to pong back to the one bash. In the two bash, um, you want to set up the overlay, which uh, you do by, or the underlay, I'm sorry, by doing the source foxy setup command. And once you have the underlay set up, which allows you, allows the system to find that ROS2 CLI. Let's use the ROS2 CLI to publish a message with the command I added into the chat. Oh, when you're done with that, do a plus one. In bash two, you should see something that says publisher beginning loop and then publishing an actual data packet in your second bash, in your two bash. I have one plus one, anyone else? Cool. All right, two, still two, still two, three. It's a little complex, it might take a second. Fair enough. Anyone having problems? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot to type that second that second command. Well, the ROS2 topic command is a lot to type. Don't don't hesitate to cut and paste. For the sake of time, of course. If you're on your own, I'd really suggest you just type it out. As a matter of fact, when you after this workshop, if you wanted to just play around with it yourself, I recommend going through the slides, which we're happy to share and just type out all the commands yourself. Okay, I think with that's four. Um, if for those who have finished publishing the message with their ROS2 command in their two bash, go back to your, for your one bash. And it probably won't say one bash at this point. Mine says one Python three, which means that in the first terminal, Python three is actually running. 
So if you select that one terminal again, you'll see the subscriber node output the message that you published in the other terminal. Does everyone see that? Or the people who've completed the two bash step? Cool. All right. One yes. This, this might be a good point to, to share your screen a little bit too. I don't know. Well, I can't. I it's oh. uh because Carlotta has control of the screen oh, and I can uh, give you I can give you rights. Do you want to share the screen? Well, then I lose my notes on what to say. <laughs> oh, okay. Just, just I pick my poison. <laughs> and I'm not running it. I'm sorry, cat. Cat. Well, cat's not running it either. It's uh, all good. Okay. You sure? Okay. Uh, not found. Getting package mo three pi not found. Um. So Simba, when you typed in callcom build, was there a was there a compile error? Or um. Simba, I hate to uh, hate to do this, but for the sake of time, why don't we do this after the workshop? I'm happy to stay online, and we could walk through it again. Does that sound good, Simba? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, fantastic. All right. So for those who've completed it, uh, you should go back to the first terminal. It won't say Bash or say Python three, but you should see your node actually output the data. The 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 message packet that you've published out in your second bash. Um, Carlotta, next slide, please. So let's learn a little bit about what's going on here. Um, as I mentioned in the overview section of ROS2, um, ROS2 is based on this publisher subscriber architecture. This pub sub architecture has nothing to do with robotics. Remember, it's just a way for to design complex software to enforce modularity so you don't have um, components talking to, to, to each other in code where you're, you've hard coded the communication. Regardless of what you're using ROS1 and ROS2, this is recap. The, ROS, the pub sub ROS2 terminolo terminologies are the following. You have ROS messages, which are the serialized data bundles that get transmitted from one ROS node to another, specifically a ROS publisher to a ROS subscriber. And they travel through this ROS topic, which is the channel that this message flows through. You can have multiple subscribers subscribing to one specific topic. You could even have multiple publishers publishing into a specific topic. And um, you know, while that could cause confusion, but ROS doesn't let you, doesn't prevent you from doing that. The one, the one thing that Ross does enforce is that everyone who talks a specific topic has to talk a specific message type, and we'll get to that in the second in the in the future slide here, or in the next slide actually. Carlotta, next slide, please. So when you create a sus subscriber and a publisher, you need to specify a specific message type or a structure for the message. In other words, the message that flows through the topics, they can't, they can't be unstructured. You can't one, at one moment publish a string message and then another moment publish a, uh, a float message into the same topic name. Ross will complain about that. There are, in terms of types, there's a couple of different types that Ross actually defined for you already. Uh, again, Ross doesn't want you to reinvent the wheel. So they have specific common use types such as the string type or the flow type. There are even complicated types such as image types. And um, I won't, we could share with you a link to some of these predefined uh, message types, but it's, uh, it, it's very, very large and very, very comprehensive for mostly all the robotic sensors that you can care for. The best practice is when you're implementing your robotics project to you reuse a ROS, predefined ROS message type uh, whenever you can, because this allows you to intershare your, your module, your package with other people, because other people can you just understand, will understand these pre-built ROS message types and just reuse them right out of the box. But in the case where you cannot find a message type that you care for, uh, you can always define your own. 
And uh, this is out of the scope out of this workshop, but uh, you there is tutorials online um, that uh, that Open Robotics publishes to show you how to define your own message type, how to publish it out, uh, and get that working. Okay, any questions about message types? Next slide, please. So let's dive into the code again. We're not going to talk about the main the main um, the main routine because it's exactly the same. You have the four parts that are needed for every ROS program, initialization, creation of the ROS node, putting the node in the spin, and then clean up and shut down. That's actually not very interesting. For this particular topic, subscriber topic example, if we look into the, um, the definition of the my subscriber node, you'll notice one specific uh, difference from the previous node example. We called a create subscription call uh, in order to create a subscriber. Our Colada, I think we lost the slide again. Colada, okay, no, cool. No slide? Oh, no, we got it back. It oh, went to okay. Google, it went to Google for some reason oh. or the web browser for some reason. Um, the, this create subscription call is a is a implemented function in the node class in the RCLPY node class. So when you inherit the node class, when my subscriber node inherits the node class, it automatically inherits this create subscription call, allowing you to create a subscription. And this call takes in four parameters. The first parameter is the type, the message type. Remember, we talked about when you create a publisher or subscriber, you have to tell Ross what type this, um, this particular subscriber cares for. In our case, it's the string type. And um, if you look at the top of the file, you'll notice that the string type is really a, uh, a namespace abbreviation for the standard messages uh, in the standard messages library, uh, which means that it is a core ROS message. The second parameter for this create subscription is a just a char name for the topic channel. And in our case, we named it, This you can name it anything you want. I decided to call it my subtopic. This is, uh, you can think of this channel name as a phone number uh, where only people who are on this number can hear each other. People, if you're subscribed to a different topic name, they won't be able to hear the messages coming through this specific topic channel. And then, the third call, the third parameter is a link to the callback routine. So whenever you see a message, whenever Ross will see a message on of string type on the my sub topic topic channel, it'll call the listener callback. Okay. And lastly, the last parameter is um, you know, apologize for this magic number here. It, it it's 10. What this 10 means is um, it we created a queue 10 deep to hold backlog messages. There will be cases um, where you can't process the messages faster than it's published. So the, the in, inflow will be faster than the, the, the time it takes for you to just take each one of these messages off the queue. When you say, when you pass in 10 into this uh, create subscription call, you're basically telling Ross to create a queue 10 large, so it keeps the last 10 messages in the queue. This way, if you overflow the queue, think of it, it's a first and first out queue. So a first and last out, right? So you'll keep the latest messages. I think I got that right. Any questions about this uh, create subscription call? All this is defined in a specification doc where I cut and pasted that link into the, uh, into the chat. So you don't need my deck of slides, just refer to the doc to get more information about all the parameters. All right. Um, last but not least, this listener callback routine uh, at the bottom here, you, it's predefined and pre-written for you, but it's a, a simple routine where once you get a message, it just dumps out the, um, the payload of that message. In this case, the whatever data, string data that comes in. Okay, any questions? Kat, did I miss anything? Uh, any color to add or? Uh, that's, that 
seems good to me. I mean, for 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 beginners, I mean, there's a lot to learn, but that's the this quick summary. And cool. I'll add that link to my notes here too, so you guys don't feel like you have to catch all of that right now. There'll just be a list of notes that you can refer back to. Okay, next slide, Carlotta. So we're going to go ahead and use the CLI again to learn a little bit more about the uh, how to use the ROS2 command or ROS2 CLI to, uh, to inspect topics. Uh, the In ROS1, you should still have your, your ROS node running. We didn't ever control C. Uh, you did receive one message. So you should see the last thing that's dumped out should be ROS2 message received by Python node. Hello from Hadabot. If you go back to the second bash terminal with the selector dropdown, you can get a list of topics by typing in ROS2 topic list. Type that into the chat. If you type that into your terminal in your two bash terminal, your second bash terminal, you should see the outputs of various um, of the various topics that are being published right now. Among them, you'll see my subtopic. Hopefully, that's the case. Once you get that working, you can use the same topic, the same topic command, ROS2 topic command, to get a little more information about the actual topic channel. So if you type in ROS2 topic info, my topic sub, you'll see three things get dumped out. Oops, I think I have a typo here. It's actually right here don't type don't type in that what i just pasted into the uh chat type this one i flipped i have a typo you'll see three things dumped out one is the type of the uh the type that's of the message that flows through this topic channel the other one is the number of publishers that are subscribing to this uh this particular particular topic um and uh, there there is no publisher remember we only created a subscriber so the publisher count should actually be zero and you should have one subscriber which is the subscriber node that's running in the first terminal if you anyone uh caught up to speed here plus one or you know for the sake of time maybe if it's if it's confusing let me know cool all right, got a couple couple of them. One one thing I want to point out here is this is a good place to start thinking about using that dash dash help in case you get stuck. Because usually, you know, if something doesn't work or something looks odd, just try the help and see if maybe it'd point you in the right direction too. Sometimes. Yeah. There's also tab completion, so if you don't want to type everything, try hitting tab. I would do the first two letters or first letter and hit tab. That sometimes helps. Right. Thanks, Cat. So you could do ROS topic help, ROS topic info help, et cetera. And it'll give you more information, okay? Um, for the astute, you'll notice this forward slash thingamajig prepended to the my subtopic. Um, that forward slash has to do with a concept in ROS called namespacing. You know, just when you thought we couldn't throw more name nomenclature at you, well, uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise, ROS is a uh, nomenclature rich. Um, we're not gonna, we're probably not gonna have time to touch more about namespaces, but um, there's this concept called namespacing in ROS, which allows you to run multiple nodes of the same name and not have them conflict with each other. Um, and that's probably all I can say without opening up another Pandora's box. Okay. All right. So moving onward, next, next slide. I'll dive a little bit deeper into this ROS2 CLI command that we wrote. It is a ROS2 topic public, oh, the ROS2 pub uh, sub command. So um, just to break things down, and this is probably extends on what Ka uh, was uh, um, saying that you can investigate yourself with the dash dash help, but every single ROS2 CLI 
has a command. And each most commands, or at least a large subset of them, have a subcommand. And at each level, you can type in a dash dash help to get more information. For this particular pub subcommand, the first parameter, this minus one that you typed in, means publish it just one time. For a lot of um, for a lot of messages, such as images, for instance, you may want to publish it at a continu continuously, maybe once every second, or maybe even 30 times a second um, to simulate what you would see from a webcam. But for our particular example, we only want to publish it once. So we pass in this minus one. The next, um, the next, per next parameter is the topic name, which should be familiar to you guys. And then finally, the type. And then finally, the payload. And the payload is always in this sort of like JSON XML like form. There is a way to um, have ROS2 CLI dump you a template of what to cut and paste um, into the final uh, the, this this final parameter here. But for the sake of time, probably won't be able to get into it. But it usually, if you publish anything, we're using the ROS2 CLI. It's going to be pretty verbose. So uh, you know, be prepared. All right, any, uh, any questions so far? Okay, I think it's last slide is the last slide. Well, we're one minute over. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it's somewhat mission accomplished. Um, we didn't have time to go into ROS2 launch files. For those who are interested, um, you know, happy to point you to a asynchronous way to learn about launch files uh, in a bit. But before we do, before I mention how to do that, um, congrats again. In summary to what we've done, uh, we talked about ROS history and design. We learned, more importantly, why it's important to learn ROS, why it's a fantastic time to learn ROS and get into robotics right now um, in the state, given the state of the world, uh, given the developments of robotics. And uh, why to learn ROS2 and not ROS1? Um, ROS1 is going to have an end of life. ROS2 is this currently the future of ROS. Uh, we went through a couple of hands-on exercises to code up and learn and dive a little bit deeper about a certain number of ROS concepts, such as nodes, packages, workspaces. Um, hopefully, you're not totally. Hopefully, you're totally clear on what overlays and underlays are now. Um, we also talked about topics and work with topics and messages. Um, so this is a lot of the information that we've gone through in two hours. Um, I'm. Uh, I you, know, you should congratulate yourself for getting through it. And uh, last but not least. Um, you, if you want to look through the launch files exercises, there's an asynchronous exercise for launch files published on hadabot.com for you to work through using this VS Code environment. So you're welcome to do so as well. Um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, thanks, Carlotta, for driving the deck of slides, Kat for helping out, and all the other facilitators for standing by to answer questions. Um, I'll pause here. Any questions? All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to stick around for another 15, maybe even 30 minutes. So um, you're welcome to do so. Carlotta or Kat, did you want to close with anything? Yes, I wanted to say something. I wanted to thank Kat and Jack for an awesome, awesome presentation. And I also wanted to thank Sam Coyote and Simeon for being our TAs today. They were working the chat for me. Thank you so much. And somebody just asked about future workshops. We absolutely have more. So I encourage you to um, go to blackandrobotics.eventbrite.com um, to see our other workshops. We do have a follow on to this one, which is the intermediate, in, intermediate two, sorry, I can't talk, where you're gonna build the Hadabot Turtle and then intermediate three would be where you're gonna program the Hadabot Turtle. The prereq for those workshops is going to be this one. So you're already a third of the way there. Um, sorry, Kat, I wanted to give you a chance to also share anything you wanted to share. Oh, I was going to say just everyone give Jack an F in the chat. I'm going to send around. I've been keeping notes on anything that like we touched on, but like needed more resources. 
Uh, so I'll send that around. Um, we also have a, a Q&A forum. It's just answers.ross.org. So that's where we normally direct people. Um, we also have a sort of forum where just Ross people hang out. So if you, um, it's in the list. I'll put it, I'll put it in the list. Just, uh, I'll send that out in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but it should, should help you along as you build more and more advanced things. And, and last but not, sorry, last but not least, uh, while we still have most of the participants, can we do the one to five again to see if uh, what, where people are at? One, I'm still totally confused. Five is I was able to follow along with the coding and I get everything. Four is I couldn't follow with the coding, but I still get everything. Maybe three is like I did the coding, but I don't, don't get it. <laughs> I see three, four, five. <laughs> 4.5, 3.5. I mean, for how much you go through right now, that's probably totally normal. I would run through, I would suggest running through it again and trying to modify it to do something else. Like if you could make it say your name or like say hello world or something like that, it's probably very um, edifying. Right. And um, uh, again, like all this, uh, these lessons, the, this workshop actually parallels the uh, asynchronous lesson modules on hadabot.com. So if you wanted to just go there without having to hear my voice again, you can read through and walk through all the lessons. They use the same code. Um, they use the same format and tools, the, uh, the, the VS Code um, browser app. And uh, maybe just going through it again will we'll, we'll get you, bump you up another score or uh, take you to the next level in terms of understanding. Or if you do want to hear Jack again, we actually have two more of the same workshop as well on that work if on that website if you want to sign up again. Well, I think um you know there might be uh it might not be my particular voice, it might be or someone cat. else's voice or, or cat's cat. voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as I said, I'll I'm stick around here for another couple of minutes if people want to hang out, but um. Now I'll hand the mic back to you, Carlotta, to formally close or. Or not cat. I, I, well, I wanted to end by sharing the mission of Black and Robotics because I should have done it at the beginning, bad little representative that I am. Um, so <laughs> the mission of Black and Robotics is to bring together Black researchers, industry professionals, and students in robotics to mutually support one another to help navigate academic, corporate, and entrepreneurial paths to success, to advocate for more diversity, equity, and inclusion within the organizations that we live and work in, and to ensure a seat at the table during the development, test, and deployment of robotic systems that affect our communities, and to amplify our collective voices for social justice. So we welcome our allies and advocates who are here with us to help promote that mission. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsors, Hadabot, Open Robotics, as well as Amazon. So if you would like to join us on Twitter, I was going to prepare a survey, then just didn't do it because we're in survey overload. But if you have <laughs> any thoughts on the workshop, just go to our Twitter account and talk about how much you love it so we can retweet it. <laughs> <laughs> just don't use the word Memphis like I did this morning and get banned from Twitter for 12 hours. Why? What? Yeah, what? seriously, it was a thing that was going on this morning. Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah, really. Anyway, I um I put a link. I didn't spell it quite right, but it says Ross Resources. Uh, it so I took a bunch of notes during class to links for stuff that I think would be helpful. I just put it in there, so it's like your one stop shop for like slides, uh, documentation for some of these things, everything you might need, and then hopefully we can start since we're gonna keep doing this workshop. I think we can. Mm -hmm you know, give it to people too. But uh, that should be able to help you out a lot. Okay, and I'll save the chat too for future reference. Cool. Okay. Did anybody have any questions? I think Simba needed to stay on to do something, correct? Was that right? Mm, I think I got him caught up, I hope. Oh, Simba's caught up, okay. Yeah, I don't know. He's good now. I did. Nobody's leaving. I mean, they act like they don't want to go. <laughs> you guys want more? Do you have more questions? We do have an Arduino workshop on March 28th, if you'd like to come back for that one. Wants to I just, just want to say thanks to everyone for, you know, organizing this. Um, Thank, was really you. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simba. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. 
Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, if no one has any questions, oh, so Duval asked if we're, we're recording. So the slides are on the link that, the, the gist.github.com link that Kat sent. I actually am recording. Um, I was actually doing it for our other TAs necessarily. I, I will have to get permission from Jack and Kat about sharing this with anyone else. It's really for the TAs coming in the future sessions, but. I have to check on how my hair looked before I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm cool with it. I'm down. Okay. I'm okay. good too. There was something proprietary fine. that you guys didn't want to go out like over the wall or. Okay. Any other the slides? Kat already gave you the slides. Yeah, they're on the so. gist.github.com. Yeah. I may have to pretty up the um, videos and put them out or something. Maybe in a private YouTube link. Whatever works. Yeah. Okay. Well, anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to jump off and uh, prep dinner. Thank you, <laughs> Sam, Coyote, Simeon. We appreciate you. See you at our next workshop. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 Thank bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye bye. Talk to you later. Bye. 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 Bye-bye, Simeon. <laughs> <laughs>